Does Israel possess nuclear weapons? The answer may be more complicated than it seems. For over five decades now, Israel has been operating under the policy of nuclear ambiguity. This means the state of Israel officially neither confirms nor denies its nuclear capabilities. But facts on the ground tell a far more intriguing tale, full of not only deception and subterfuge, but constant speculation too. If Israel does maintain a nuclear arsenal, where did it produce it and test it? How many nuclear weapons does the country currently possess? How can Israeli defense forces deliver these weapons during a war? And last but not least, how do they fit into the Israeli military strategy? Let's take a look at these questions one by one. From the moment that Israel was established in May 1948, it faced multiple threats to its existence. Its neighbors were larger, hostile and more populous. Besides, due to its specific shape and size, Israel lacked strategic depth to mount a deep defense of its territory. An enemy fighter jet could fly across all of Israel from the Mediterranean Sea to River Jordan within four minutes at subsonic speed. The Israeli military had to compensate for their country's quantitative disadvantages with superior quality, firepower and maneuverability. Considering this, it only makes sense Israel would be interested in developing its nuclear arsenal. While Israel doesn't have nuclear power plants, it does possess a facility equipped with a nuclear reactor. Negev Nuclear Research Center was built near the city of Dimona in late 1950s. It was built with French assistance, according to the bilateral agreement called the Protocol of Sevres. The facility was constructed in utmost secrecy. Reportedly, the French sent components like the reactor tank, claiming it was a part of a desalination plant bound for South America. US intelligence agencies discovered this nuclear facility in the early 1960s. However, by that time, the reactor was already active. Yet even then, the Israeli government claimed its primary purpose was a peaceful one. Israel agreed to periodic inspections, but under several conditions. Instead of representatives from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United States would send their inspectors. They also had to announce their inspections in advance, allowing Israel an opportunity to mislead outside visitors by erecting false walls and preventing them from inspecting certain parts of the facility. There are even stories about Israelis building a fake control center atop a real one. Because of this, by the late 1960s, US inspectors concluded their visits were pretty much useless and that Israel most likely possessed nuclear weapons. But merely building nuclear weapons isn't enough. Any weapon, especially such a powerful one, needs to be tested. We already mentioned the Protocol of Sevres. It stipulated full access by the Israeli scientists to data the French gathered during the 1960 nuclear tests in what used to be called French Algeria. But there are rumors the Israelis performed nuclear tests of their own. Several journalists and military magazines claimed that in the early 1960s the IDF detonated nuclear devices underground in the Negev desert. While these were primarily speculations, there is at least one event that might indicate Israel performed an actual test, the so-called Vela incident. In September 1979, an old American Vela Hotel satellite detected a double flash of light near the Prince Edward Islands in the Indian Ocean. Some experts claimed the signal might have been a mistake caused by a tiny meteor striking the satellite. However, Vela satellites previously detected over 40 double flashes. Each of those turned out to be a nuclear explosion test. If this was the case now, who would detonate a nuclear weapon in the Indian Ocean? Experts suggested various possible culprits, including the Soviet Union, Pakistan, India and France. But 40 years later, the theory that sounds most intriguing is that the test may have been a joint venture between Israel and South Africa. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, South Africa pursued a nuclear program. However, its bombs weren't operational at the time of the Vela incident. Furthermore, all of its six nuclear weapons were accounted for after the collapse of apartheid. After the Vela incident, several journalists claimed Israel and South Africa have been working together on nuclear tests. The Israeli nuclear device, if in fact it even was one, was deliberately detonated during inclement weather. 
plus the test took place when there weren't any satellites above the area. Other countries didn't know about this particular Vela satellite because it was officially retired by the US government. But if the Vela incident was a nuclear detonation, it was an unusually clean one, leaving very little radiation in the aftermath. Four decades after it happened, this incident remains a mystery. The main question about the Israeli nuclear arsenal is how many warheads does the country have? Over the years, estimates varied significantly, from 75 warheads up to 400. These assumptions came from analyzing the possible number of delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons and the amount of weapons-grade plutonium that the Negev Nuclear Research Center could produce. The reactor in Dimona came online in the early 1960s. It has been in use ever since, probably operating around 200 to 300 days per year. Estimates about the power level of the reactor vary between 75 and 200 megawatts. However, in 1986, a dismissed Israeli nuclear technician, Mordecai Vananu, released photographs he took at the alleged underground bomb factory. He indicated that the power level of the reactor was around 75 megawatts. Analysis of the satellite imagery, gathered between 1971 and the year 2000, shows that during that time, Israel hasn't constructed new cooling towers around the facility. Therefore, the power level of the Negev Nuclear Research Center and the amount of plutonium it produced probably remained constant. The Federation of American Scientists estimates Israel can produce around 20 kilograms of plutonium per year. Finally, again according to Vananu, Israel nuclear weapons use about 4 kilograms of plutonium each. Mind you, even these numbers are somewhat misleading. The Negev Nuclear Research Center is over half a century old now, meaning its production capacity has probably decreased with time. Considering these factors, it becomes increasingly likely that Israel has relatively few nuclear weapons. In its 2020 report, the Federation of American Scientists suggests the country might have around 90 nuclear warheads, a far cry from some estimates that speculate about 400 warheads. In what ways could Israel deploy 90 nuclear warheads in the field? According to the analysts, Israeli defense forces seem to have successfully developed the so-called nuclear triad. This three-pronged military structure allows armed forces to deliver their nuclear arsenal by land, sea and air. In this way, armed forces significantly decrease the chance that an enemy could destroy their entire arsenal in a first strike attack. One of the principal ways Israel could deliver its nuclear weapons is by using the long-range Jericho missiles. This loosely related series of surface-to-surface -surface projectiles have been in operational use by the IDF since the late 1960s. Israel ordered its first ballistic missiles from the French company Dassault in 1963. But after the Six-Day War in 1967, France imposed an embargo on selling new military equipment to Israel production of missiles was soon relocated to Israel. Jericho II followed in the mid-1980s. Based on a commercial design, an Israeli space launch rocket called Shave, Jericho II performed test flights up to a range of 1300 kilometers. The latest version, Jericho III, entered service in 2011. It allegedly has a range between 5000 and 6000 kilometers, and its payload could reach up to 1300 kilograms. If these specifications aren't exaggerated, Jericho 3 could be considered an actual ICBM. Then there are submarines. These vessels are ideal platforms for delivering nuclear weapons. They are mobile and can try to hide underwater. Because of this, they can survive the initial nuclear attack and retaliate against the enemy. Israel currently uses several Dolphin-class submarines. Diesel electric submarines are the biggest ships of their type built by Germany since World War II. The Dolphin 1 class is over 57 meters long and has a surface displacement of 1600 tons. Dolphin 2 submarines are even larger, with a length of almost 70 meters and a surface displacement of 2000 tons. For a long time, some military analysts have been speculating Israel has armed these vessels with modified Popeye missiles. These were initially solid-fuel air-to-surface missiles. Once again, official information is scarce and other sources often exaggerate the weapon specifications. 
but it is believed submarine versions of projectiles, called Popeye Turbo, have little in common with the original missiles. They are more akin to a Tomahawk cruise missile, with a jet engine, folding wings and an increased range. There was one alleged test observed by the US Navy in 2002, with a range of 1500 kilometers, which would make these missiles suitable for delivering nuclear warheads. Throughout the decades, the Israeli Air Force has relied on utilizing several types of American combat jets. Airplanes like the A-4 Skyhawk, F-4 Phantom, F-15E and F-16 have all been routinely fitted by the United States for delivery of nuclear weapons. There is absolutely no reason to believe Israel couldn't achieve the same thing. Furthermore, Israel has a fleet of airplanes modified for aerial refueling. They drastically increased the operational range of Israeli combat jets during Operation Wooden Leg in 1985. During this operation, the Israeli Air Force successfully struck targets in Tunisia, over 2000 kilometers from Israeli airfields. There are even more speculations about other possible ways Israel might utilize its nuclear arsenal. Over the years, there have been talks about neutron bombs, self-propelled heavy artillery capable of firing tactical nuclear shells, and nuclear landmines hidden in the Golan Heights. The most fanciful rumor may be the one about a miniaturized nuclear weapon concealed within a suitcase. Mind you, there is a reasonable chance Israeli intelligence spread at least some of these stories deliberately to confuse and demoralize the enemies of Israel. Speaking of Israel and its enemies, how does the nuclear arsenal tie into an Israeli defense strategy? Ever since Israel was established in 1948, its principal objective was simple, as a country, it can't afford to lose a single war. One of the ways to ensure this is by maintaining a credible deterrent posture to avert a war. This includes the willingness to carry out preemptive strikes against possible enemies. If that fails, Israel can try to take control of the conflict by waging it quickly and decisively. One would expect nuclear weapons would present a logical extension of the policy of deterrence. And yet, Israel has maintained the policy of nuclear ambiguity for decades. Additionally, the IDF have mostly prepared their operations as if they could only rely on conventional weapons like tanks, artillery and airplanes. Indeed, for years, Israel has been insisting it won't be the first country to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. And yet, that doesn't mean the country isn't ready to send its nukes out into the field. During the Yom Kippur War, in October 1973, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir allegedly decided to put nuclear-armed F-4s on 24-hour alert. Their target list included Egyptian and Syrian military headquarters, not far from large cities like Cairo and Damascus. Israel did so primarily as a way to push the Soviets into reigning in their Arab allies. Two decades later, during the 1991 Gulf War, Iraq attacked Israel with Scud missiles. In response, the country went on full-scale nuclear alert. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon warned President George W. Bush his country was ready to respond in kind to any enemy attack utilizing a weapon of mass destruction. For decades there have been talks about the so-called Samson option. Named after the biblical hero who single-handedly toppled the Temple of Dagon, this strategy proposes using nuclear weapons as a last resort against a country whose armed forces have either invaded or destroyed much of Israel. This caused some consternation among experts considering the possible level of indiscriminate destruction such a strategy could produce. Discussing the Samson option necessitates guessing and speculation. However, Israel's policy towards other countries in the region developing their nuclear arsenal has been crystal clear. Since the early 1980s, the State of Israel has adopted the so-called Begin Doctrine. Named after Prime Minister Menachem Begin, the doctrine postulates a need for preemptive strikes against any potential enemies looking to develop weapons of mass destruction. The Begin Doctrine was formulated in June 1981, after the Israeli Air Force conducted a planned code named Operation Opera. A flight of F-16 fighter jets, escorted by F-15s, attacked the unfinished Osirak nuclear reactor just 17 kilometers from Baghdad. At the time, the international community criticized the attack. But Israel claimed Iraq, at the time governed by Saddam Hussein, was trying to develop nuclear capabilities. 
In September 2007, Israel launched a similar attack on an unfinished nuclear reactor at the Al Kibar site in Syria. Operation Outside the Box was carried out by the Israeli Air Force F 15s and accompanied by electronic signals intelligence aircraft. This time, there was no widespread outcry condemning the attack. Israel learned its lesson and kept the operation secret. The government only disclosed it publicly in 2018. What helped keep the operation secret was that Syria was also concealing the fact it was building a nuclear reactor. This was something that was confirmed in 2011 by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Finally, in a joint operation codenamed the Olympic Games, Israel and the United States developed a malicious computer worm called Staxnet. First revealed in 2010, the virus caused significant damage to Iran's nuclear program. After 60 years of military and political analysis, it looks as if Israel has nuclear capabilities. Even if we disregard wilder rumors, evidence on the ground shows that the state of Israel has nuclear production capabilities and weapon systems for delivering a nuclear payload. But such an arsenal comes with a price. By 2004, the Negev Nuclear Research Center had been operational for at least 40 years. That's a long time for such a facility. Around that time, Israeli authorities began distributing iodine anti-radiation tablets to thousands of residents living near the center, just in case. In February 2021, satellite images confirmed Israel has been expanding what is now called Shimon Peres Negev Nuclear Research Center for several years. Considering the age of the facility, this is hardly surprising. But the fact we even know this points towards the more substantial truth. Nowadays, it is far more difficult to hide something as big as a nuclear research program. If Israel wants to continue its policy of nuclear opacity, it will need to step up its game. Otherwise, its nuclear arsenal will remain the worst kept secret in the world. Or maybe that's precisely the point. And don't forget about that Rise of Kingdoms offer. If you click the link below, you will get a Civilization Change coupon worth $50, as well as great in-game rewards. There is also a link to participate in a contest where you can win various iPhone 12s and lots of in-game resources. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.